Good afternoon. This, uh, this uh, lecture will be recorded um, so that, that you are aware of it. Thank you very much for being here. I would like to welcome you to the Navigating Change in the Museum, a lecture by Erika Hirogami titled Aesthetics of Undocu Undocumentedness <laughs> and the Creative Labor in the Art Industry, which will be chaired by Delia Sofia Zacarias. The ASU LAGMA Navigating Change in the Museum series looks at the city museum practices and is part of the ASU LAGMA Museum Fellowship, which was founded in 2018, is a program, uh, a partnership between ASU and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, but it also now has several institutions participating, the Paris Art Museum, the Hurt Museum, the ASU Art Museum, the Phoenix Art Museum, and the Memphis Brook Art Museum. Uh, this was a program created to uh, aim to culturally diversify the staff and leadership of our museums in the United States by providing a free three-year degree program in art history um, in order to support uh, the idea that there is going to be, you know, we need a change in leadership and create a more culturally diverse generation of museum professionals in this country. So I would like to introduce Delia Sofia Zacarias. Delia Sofia Zacarias is one of the fellows in the program currently. She's a second year LACMA fellow in art history. She's based in the LACMA director office as the executive administration and fellow. She's currently researching curatorial activism as it pertains to Latinx trauma and migration along the US-Mexico borderland. Thank you, Delia Sofia, and thank you, Erica. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us here today for this uh, wonderful, wonderful talk uh, by Erika Hirugami. I'd like to introduce our, our lovely um, speaker today. Erika is a first-generation transnational Japanese Mexican American, formerly undocumented. She holds an MA in art history art business from the Sotheby's Institute of Art in conjunction with the Drucker School of Management and Getty Leadership Institute at Claremont Graduate University. Her most recent MA from Chicanx Studies at UCLA is entitled Political Art Action, The Aesthetics of Undocumentedness. Erika holds BAs in the fields of art history, Chicano studies, and Mexican studies from UCLA, currently a lecturer and doctoral uh, candidate at UCLA, where she epistemologically braids the aesthetics of undocumentedness to challenge immigration, immigration policy and politics. Erika is, a, is the founder and CEO of Curator Love, co-founder of the Undoc Plus Collective, the ED at AHSC, a professor at CGU's CBM Arts and SMC, Arts for LA Fellow, NALAC NLI Fellow, and CCI Catalyst. As a Getty and Crest Foundation Fellow, she has developed curatorial statements at museums across Mexico and the United States. After being a public art curator for the Department of Curatorial Affairs in the city of Los Angeles, she became the curatorial director for the Ronald McDonald House Charities while leading various commercial galleries. Erika has curated exhibitions for multiple spaces across the globe and her written work has been published internationally. But so without further ado, I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome to Erika. Thank you so much for being here today and hand over the virtual platform over to her. Thank you for having me. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know if this works. Yes, um, please do. Thank you. So first and foremost, thank you for the invitation to present on the topic of my doctoral work. It's been, it's been a couple of years thinking through undocumentedness academically. It's been decades of embodying it. It's been a lifetime of figuring out what it means. Um, but here, right, as of recently, I'm thinking about undocumentedness aesthetically, qualitatively and quantitatively to utilize the tools of academia. And I'm thinking as it through curatorial acompañamiento, um, which I pose as intricately tied to navigating change at museums. 
So I'm a first generation immigrant, formerly undocumented, and I'm half Japanese, half Mexican. And it has been both a pleasure and a heartbreaking challenge to create knowledge from within my community. So I appreciate the opportunity to share. Um, now, this is where my profit kicks in, right? I tell my students every time, like, kind of a layout of my presentation so that they know when to take a break. But I'm going to begin by outlining just a roadmap of where I'm going with this. I will discuss terminology because it's really important that we understand what we're talking about. I'm going to talk about quantitative data, qualitative data, and then provide some information and highlight possible resources, as well as upcoming projects for undoc creatives. So let's start with undocumentedness. For the better part of the conversation, undocumentedness is always tied to policy and politics. Like we cannot escape talking about statuses when it comes to undocumentedness. But the reality is that policies and politics subjugate giant chunks of the community and it serves no one to think about people through law. Um, for the better part of this, right, in the words of Abhi Chomsky, and I quote, it seems right and natural to us that people should be divided by citizenship and documented into different categories with differential rights. We assume that the world is naturally divided into countries and that every human being somehow belongs in one country or another. People are supposed to stay in the country where they're from unless they can get special permissions to go into another. But there's nothing natural about the state of affairs. Countries, sovereignty, citizenship, and laws are all social constructs that are invented by human beings. End quote. So by and large, when it comes to thinking about undocumentedness in the United States, the media equates it with being a purely Mexican concern. It is as of recently, right? Contemporary media has as in the last couple of decades made this just an, a Mexican issue, but the reality is that this shifts based on how the policies change. Um, in a recent study by the Pew Research Center, it states that amongst new arrivals, Asian outnumber Latinx people and have done so in the past decades, but that's different than what contemporary media understands it to be. And also when we talk about undocumentedness, we make it synonymous with menial labor which I'm showing here in the work of Narciso Martinez, who's an immigrant artist and currently residing and working out of Los Angeles. So in a post-pandemic universe, we all became really familiar with what it meant to be an essential part of the population. And we associate this essentialness to being undocumented and to farm labor and to menial labor, such as gardening and housekeeping, et cetera. But the reality here is that that is no longer the case. And we need to start thinking about how to have a different conversation about undocumentedness that's beyond just how people from other communities need to come and service the people living in the United States. So the work of Narciso Martinez, right, as shown here, dignifies undocumented labor primarily from the central fields of California, which he is closest to. So with that and beyond that, I've started to think about undocumentedness as a spectrum because we need to think about not just undocumentedness as a dichotomy to citizenship. And so undocumentedness is much more complicated, right? There's no easy way to define undocumentedness and no single definition that stands true across the globe. And mindfully undocumentedness and not it's not a US specific issue. Like this is a concern all throughout the world. In the words of Jose Amit Antonio Vargas, who's also an undoc immigrant, if there's an estimated 45 million immigrants living in America, then there are 45 million ways of being an immigrant in America. Like all groups, we are not a monolith. Of those 45 million immigrants, and as per the Department of Homeland Security, 11 million immigrants are currently residing in the United States unauthorized. Borrowing from Jose Antonio Vargas's logic, if there are 11, there are 11 million ways of being undocumented in the United States. Thus, to completely comprehend undocumentedness, and in the words of Federico Cuatlacuatl, one must consider undocumentedness a spectrum, which is where things get intricate. 
So I've created my own working model and it's by no means perfect. It's where I'm at in this thought process at the moment because living undocumented, living undocumented evolves over time, right? There are new policies that come and change how we have to think about this community, my community. This past week alone, right, our current administration decided that refugee needs to now be rethought. And this is something that we don't know how to address from within the space yet. So again, it is by no means perfect because it is incredibly complex and it's ever changing. But I think that this is a more humanistic approach that removes me from thinking about people as statuses. Now I'm gonna go and explain just a tiny little bit of how I'm thinking about it. And again, this is a living document. The more I learn, the more it grows. But it within undocumentedness, we have people who are unprotected and within the unprotected community, there are people who are at risk, meaning at risk for deportation or who are deportees already. So while you are a deportee, you're in deportation proceedings and if you're deported, that can mean that you exit the country, but if you're deported, that can also mean that you're returned. So you can be in this country post-deportation, and those are people most at risk and unprotected within this community. So there are people who are unprotected but not at risk because they're not in deportation proceedings, which is the second portion of the spectrum. And then there are people who have protected statuses. So within protective statuses, this does give someone certain rights, but not all of them, definitely not citizenship rights. So here we have the DACA people, um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. There's people who have advanced parole who request small permissions to exit the country. And then there's people who have the PSA, which is... Um, a permission that's not different than DACA, but I think it's mostly for Central American people. So what I've I've talked about and what I've kind of began to think about um, after conversations with Fede is that undocumentedness spectrum, right, ends at the gray line that you see in this graph, marks embodiment. So everybody inside the undocumented spectrum has either been undocumented or is undocumented today. Now in the undoc spectrum, that also includes refugees and asylum seekers, people who have previously naturalized, people who are currently naturalizing, because as you're naturalizing, you get some level of protection and people who are formally undocumented regardless of status, which may or may not also include some citizens. I'm personally a citizen of the United States by naturalization who is formally undocumented, but I've also embodied undocumentedness. So within undoc spectrum, this is where you will find everyone who has lived the experience or is currently living undocumented. So beyond that, you have the undocumented diaspora, which is people who are adjacent to undocumentedness. Now this is, there's different levels of adjacency to undocumentedness, right? It means something completely different that your parents are undocumented, that your partner is undocumented, that your children are undocumented. So for instance, growing up, when I came into this country, for me, I was the only one in the undoc spectrum, but my entire family was in the undoc diaspora. So that includes offsprings, parents, it includes mixed status families, and it doesn't need to be the immediacy of your household. Because if your tios are undoc, you know what being undoc means. If your madrina is undoc, right? And this means extended family, and it also means visa holding immigrants. So visa holding immigrants are a particularly different bundle that we're not tying into the undoc spectrum because they come in with a full set of rights, even if it's not citizen rights but they're not subjugated by the law for labor and all sorts of other things like driving. And it can leave to their country if they so wish to. So beyond that, we have the host society, even though I still think that the host society is part of the undoc diaspora because the host society is affected by undocumentedness, right? Legally speaking, today, we cannot all be equally governed under the law because people in the undoc spectrum are governed differently. So if we wanted to fully possess citizenship rights under the laws of this country, undocumented people would need to help them too. So I don't assume that you can have it either or. So the host society is the furthest from um, the UNDOC, UNDOC Plus Center, but it's also not completely removed from. So one thing that 
we need to think about is how all of this challenges the understanding of people beyond statuses. I'm not thinking about who has a visa or who doesn't have a visa for the purposes of thinking about their humanity and thinking about how to create a community with them. But also we need to be extremely cognizant in this community that not every single person of the community can outwardly say that they're in the community. There's a lot of stigma tied to being undocumentedness. There's a lot of legal implications to outing yourself as undoc, right? I personally was not super comfortable for years and years and years about talking about my own immigrant status. And that happens intergenerationally. So like, I know a lot of people who are of younger generations from the harshest parts of the law in the 80s, who will never out themselves as undocumented to their families and friends, right? But also one thing that's beyond interesting for this community is that this community is is not like the other communities where one single thing lumps us all together right because this community includes trans individuals queer individuals black individuals api individuals people who are you know disabled people who are neurodivergent like there's undocumentedness affects us all which is why I'm baffled that arts organizations have not yet considered migration or for that matter, undocumentedness as a part of their just as diversity, equity and inclusion policies. But that's where we are today. And so moving beyond that, um, I think that I divest from the, li the line of reasoning that I've just explained. I mean, I'm gonna divest from that line of reasoning so that I can continue to communicate um, that I want to create knowledge from within my community. This is by no means something that I'm making myself, right? And it is here where politically speaking, two people can be governed in the same way. I'm sorry, I already said that. So for the purposes of my research, I'm gonna explain to you where this kind of takes place. So one thing that we need to be cognizant of too is that all of this vocabulary, all of, this, all of the things that I'm talking about has emerged from within something called documented. So there are people who are in the DACA side of the spectrum, in the protected statuses, who for the first time ever are becoming professionals in their own right. So whereas before undocumentedness meant that you were coming from another country and you had very little education. This is the first time in history because of DACA that passed in June 2012 that Generation 1.5, and I will explain what that means in two seconds, um, is now educated in the United States. So they got here as babies, right? And because DACA passed over a decade ago, this means that right now we have undocumented doctors and undocumented lawyers and that were trained in the United States. However, we need to also be cognizant of the fact that the people within this protected status are less than 5% of the undoc community. And these are also the people who are, for the better part, undocumented and unafraid because they have some kind of legal protection. And also these are the people who are like more courageous because this is the generation that went and got nearly self-deported so that they can talk about the undoc community out loud. So this is something that is different in different fields of scholarship, generation, immigrant generations. I've heard it from sociologists utilized in a different way, but for the purposes of my research, and I talk about immigrant generations, not citizen generations. The first generation immigrant is immigrant who departs their country. I'm a first generation immigrant, right? Uh, generation 1.5 or 0.5 came to the United States as a child. So most people with DACA are a part of Generation 1.5, which some scholars and some sociologists also speak of as a Generation 0.5. And the second generation is the first of, right, the children of immigrants. So the first citizen born within the United States of a child of immigrants. So it is this kind of vocabulary within this community that mingles all our statistics because some people will utilize 0.5 to speak for 1.5 and some people will say, well, first generation as in I'm the first generation citizen and right, like this is where talking about it and learning about it and even statistically speaking to this gets really murky. So it is in here that I started to 
be extremely cognizant of speaking to undoc creatives. So we have undoc lawyers, we have undoc doctors, and we also have undoc artistas. We have undoc arts professionals. We have undoc curators. We have undoc filmmakers. So the term undoc creative means an undocumented member of the creative industries. Now I speak about the creative industries at large and not just museums because museums and museum work and visual artwork is but a percentage of the creative industries. And for the purposes of data, it's much easier to figure it out if you're, you're working on a larger scale. So it is important that, you know, we think about undoc creatives not being exclusively DACA. So yes, we're the ones who are thinking through the vocabulary and also I'm not DACA. So that tells you, right, how many um, people are thinking through this, but, at the same time, undoc creatives are by and large right now out loud holders of MFAs and BFAs or are like myself hyper-documented. So hyper-documentedness is a term coined by Aurora Chang that speaks to undoc academics who need to amass degrees to stand in for the documents that we cannot get. So while we're waiting to be naturalized, because right we're thinking about our immigrant trauma and thinking that we need to also be seen on paper we go and we get degrees. So I personally have about a dozen of them um, because we somehow believe that if you receive more education, that means you're less undocumented or something. It's a very intriguing um, line of reasoning. But it is here where I turn to the quantitative portions of this analysis so that I can openly discuss the qualitative work. Now, the resources that I've gathered to kind of converge onto my data analytics come from everything from the census, the Migration Policy Institute, USC's Equity Research Institute, Soilas Report, which is the state of immigration in Los Angeles, and the Otis Creative Economy Reports. So overall, we know that in Los Angeles alone, alone there are about 4 million people, which means, and in California, there are around 40 million people. So the undocked population of Los Angeles alone is closer to 800,000 and in California, it's closer to 2.7 million. So beyond that, we know that the creative population of Los Angeles alone is nearly a million people. Um, and in California is about 4 million people. Putting all of this together mathematically translates to in Los Angeles County alone, there being more than 200,000 undocked creatives and for California, 270,000. Now, I'm not going to tell you that this data is conclusive. This, this data subset, it's in its infancy, right? I've gathered information only of Los Angeles and by default, California. But com much comparable research is pending. I honestly hope that in the future, I can do a longitudinal study to see how this um, community grows over time. But also, I want comparable analysis with other states and other cities across the country, and maybe someday, you know, a full on chunk federal at the countrywide level to know how many undoc creatives in the entire country. Now, it is here that I will turn to these undoc creatives. So, for the purposes of my research, I've been conducting testimonios with a ton of undoc creatives. Now, they're intermingled with autoethnography to center my community's cultural competence, but also my own. And as per Chicana scholar Dolores Delgado Bernal, Rebecca Burciaga, and Judith Flores Carmona, a testimonial challenges objectivity by situating the individual in communion with a collective experience marked by marginalization, oppression, or resistance. This methodology moves beyond interview as testimonio is and continues to be an approach that incorporates political, social, historical, and cultural histories accompanying one's life experience to bring about change through consciousness racing. So as I said, over the past couple of years, I've talked to many undocumented creatives to get a sense of who they are and what their lives are all about. And so the following are just a few examples of stories that I will tap onto. And for the purpose of transparency, I've adopted together with them to conduct this kind of research and anonymity because not all members of the undocumented community and the undocumented spectrum are undocumented and unafraid. Many people rather not speak about being undocumentedness out loud. So they can't exhibit my work in their museum it comes from the story of a woman who volunteers at one of our local museums in Los Angeles County and she's undocumented. And the museum director 
flaunts her in front of collectors and to the board to speak about the efforts that he's doing um, for the immigrant community, but he won't give her an exhibition. He can't sell her artwork in the gallery shop because the museum has a shop that sells wares and he cannot employ her, but he utilizes her narrative to get money for the museum. My recent deportation to portray my thoughts on canvas comes from the gallery realm. So this doesn't just affect the nonprofit, it also affects the for-profit. This story comes from an adult creative who works at one of our local galleries. He's, um, he's a maker. He makes for blue color artists within this gallery. Um, and every so sporadically, whenever he um, asks for a raise, which mind you, he hasn't gotten one in over a decade his boss, the gallery director, will threaten to deport him instead of give him, you know, an extra $2. I was too exhausted to be undocumented and an artist. Comes from a filmmaker um, and an actress because this also expands to other portions of the creative industries. So in this case in particular, um, this individual became an art administrator because when she was an actor, she auditioned to a bunch of different roles and she didn't get any because she's indigenous brown female presenting and whenever she did get a role that had to do with her positionality they asked her to be undocumented and she was like wow for the first time in my life I'm going to be undoc and I'm going to do it through the arts and she was super excited until the two minutes that she had to play in the film were her being deported that day she quit the film industry and she became um, an arts administrator. So now my findings, um, and I'm sorry, don't mind me crying, but my research always makes me tear up. My findings are that um, Los Angeles is kind of poised to usher the new wave of undocumented creative legal labor because it is within Los Angeles County that things such as um, a more diverse and inclusive workforce is necessary. But also last year in the county, we approved the, the motion to waive citizenship requirements for county employees, which is huge as there are enormous barriers towards people getting hired legally at various organizations. Now this is at the county city level, but it has zero to no correlation at the moment with museums and the art industry, which is kind of, again, heartbreaking. Through my research, I found that there is a handful of organizations across the country at large that are here to benefit undoc creatives. So in California, and this particularly applies to Los Angeles, but these organizations also service the rest, some of these organizations service the rest of the country. The California Arts Council, is California specific, but they offer tiny bits of funding in contrast to the funding that they offered for all of California to some undoc creatives. The Center for Cultural Innovation um, has grants and funding that are free of citizenship requirements. Fellowships, Define America services the whole country. Um, the Center for Cultural Power is located in California and they service most of California. And then the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective also services the whole country. So these organizations have began to see a need for immigrant narratives or undocumented narratives to be a part of the art canon, but are also trying to shift the conversation, right? Immigrants Rising provides business development for creatives, for immigrant creatives. And the Los Angeles County um, of Arts and Culture and the House of Alegria provide artistic residencies in California for undoc creatives. So the goal here is to start to think about immigrants and empower immigrants to speak through their own intersectionality and positionality about issues of immigration, migration, and undocumentedness. Now, because I've been doing this research for the past three years and because I didn't think this was enough, right? Like all of the information I've given you is a result of three-ish years of research beyond the time I spent being undocumented myself. Um, and as a response to the fact that we saw so little in terms of 
how much was possible and how much was helping our community. Me and artist Francis, Francisco, sorry, Federico Cuatlacuatl decided to um, start our own collective. So we named it the Undoc Collective. And this is um, the brainchild of my previously existing company, Curator Love, and Fede's existing company, Rascuache, which is a residency in Mexico City. And through it, we did the only natural thing that could be done. We found our people. We found our community. And we did this be a snowball uh, methodology, right? One led to the other, that led to the other, that led to the other. Because if you're undoc, you know, and if two people know in the arts that you're undoc because there's so little of us, we all kind of want to be best friends immediately. So logically, um, within a relatively short amount of time, we found our people and we found our people all over the country, right? Um, Federico's like stationed in Virginia I'm in Los Angeles we've met people in Utah there's people in Minnesota there's there's people all over the country who are facing similar issues and who have similar backgrounds but also I'm an expert in California law so more undoc arts administrators who are thinking through this intersectionality in other states is also very needed um through this collective effort, we all got together a couple of months ago. No, actually a month ago, because it was the end of January. I'm sorry, don't mind me. I don't know when I live anymore. Um, and did the first ever community gathering for Undoc creatives. And you see them here. You see some of them here and some of the members of the Undoc diaspora together talking about immigration and making scenes because undocumentedness is also joyful. With the Undoc Collective, we did a symposium and an exhibition at the University of Virginia, which is the first of many. Our symposium brought together Undoc creatives from the same Undoc creatives that we met from across the country. The exhibition brought together all of the creatives that we have come across or the ones that we knew at the moment. Um, Pertenecer Encarnar, the Aesthetics of Undocumentedness is what the exhibition's title was. The exhibition gave us all an excuse to see the different media that artists, visual artists and film artists are using to talk about undocumentedness, but also it allows the conversation that we're having to be guided from within the arts, not from within policy and politics. And it was also the first time in which a, we were all in a group of undoc creatives. B, we were all in a group of people who spoke the same language, not just about undocumented, it's not just about migration, but also about art. And this was also the first time in which we were just, you know, openly allowed to feel the joy of being an immigrant without this demonizing and fetishizing, institutionalizing way in which people speak about migration as if it were a bad thing. And in here, right, the exhibition and the symposium focused around embodiment. Um, what you're seeing here is a picture of Guadalupe Maravilla, who's an artist based in New York, who went to a detention center where teenagers who have been immigrants who are now detained need to continue to feel joy. And he brought art to kind of have a conversation with them. Beyond the fact that we all embody undocumentedness, this was also an excuse for us to understand more about our ancestry. We don't all come from the same planet. We're not from the same countries. We're not all Mexican. Mindfully, we're heavily Mexican because Mexicans all know each other, clearly. But we have people in our, in our collective who are Ecuadorian. We have people who are um, Salvadoran, we have people who are Guatemalan, we have people who are Filipino, right? And our collective efforts are growing and we're learning from our different ancestries because what unites us is an event, not a race and not a gender and not a sexual preference. So we get to celebrate all of who we are. Um, this is an artwork by Luis Alvaro Sagun that speaks to his own immigrant journey. So in the middle of the symposium and the exhibition, we launched a series of publications. This is two of three. 
So the first book, Pertenecer a Encarnar, Aesthetics of Undocumentedness, that you're seeing on your left, is the book, the catalog for the exhibition. But beyond the catalog for the exhibition, um, I chose to also include a page where each of the artists speaks about their relationship to migration so that you can better understand not just my curatorial statement, because at the end of the day, that's not important, but how we all come to be where we're at and what unites us all and how we all think about being immigrant, right? For some people, it's still very painful and still very traumatizing. For other people, it's a matter of empowerment and joy. Other people are thinking about it, about beauty. Other people are thinking about ancestry, all those things are far more important to me than anything I could have written about the artwork. The second portion of the book, um, the second version of the book, so is in German. So the first iteration is in Spanish and English. The second iteration is in Spanish, English, and German. And the third iteration will have Nahuatl and a language that I'm blanking on from Central America's indigenous tongues. So beyond the series of books that we're launching to speak about ourselves, for ourselves, by ourselves. We also launched an artist residency and exhibition, which was an open call that we did a couple of months back. And it was the first ever Undoc Plus exclusive resource of this nature. So we are sending some, we're giving someone a travel stipend, we're giving someone lodging, we're giving someone um, a studio and we're giving them resources so that they can create for a few months if they choose to if they choose not to we're also that's also fine with us if they just need to be a part of our community that's something that we're encouraging and we're providing them with professional development from the various people in the collective so that we can learn from each other what we need to continue to thrive so we're not done, right? This, this was just the first year of our collective efforts. The collective started in 2022. And in one year, we've done a lot, but also we have so much more that we want to accomplish. First and foremost, we don't know all of our community. And thankfully, based on the projects that we have been doing, our community continues to you know, wave from afar. At this point, since the symposium started, um, ended actually, happened, I've had at least 10 people reach me like, hey, I'm an undoc creative and I teach at this university. Like, hey, I'm an undoc creative and I'm like doing my MFA over here. So one of our goals is to continue to expand our network so that we can continue to create our own resources for each other. Another thing that's coming up for not just Los Angeles. So my policy report for the Arts for LA focuses specifically on undoc creatives in Los Angeles, and it will act as a resource how-to guide for institutions and for people in the undoc diaspora so that they can figure out what it is policies can be shifted within their organizations or you know, just a matter of self, right? How do you learn language about immigration? And what can museums do to start centering undoc creatives at every level of the, of the museum realm? There are policy recommendations for developers. There are policy recommendations for people doing funding. There's policy recommendations for museums, for curators. There's policy recommendations for everybody. And that will come out somewhere in the next few months for Arts for LA, and it'll be digitally available. The Define America How-To Guide is a collective effort in between myself, the team of Define America, and other undoc creatives, that will be even more specific. It'll act as a how-to guide for HR people in the arts and film industries so that they know how to hire undoc creatives. So many, many more kind of informational toolkits are coming. And of course, I cannot, I can never have enough books. Um, another book on the aesthetics of undocumentedness is coming. This one is entitled Political Art Action, which is the title of my last master's. And this one specifically demystifies naturalization. So what does it mean to have a relationship to your passport? And yeah, that cover is baby me and my baby passport. I think I was three or something at the time. Um, but the entire um, context of it talks about the bureaucratization of naturalization and what we can learn from aesthetics to demystify statuses. 
we're also going to have the inaugural uh, residency and exhibition later this year in summer. We haven't even said yet who our winners are, but we will say that like in um, in a short amount of time. So what's interesting about this project is that whereas the efforts that we did in the symposium are for people who are professionally already a part of the arts, this inaugural um, residency is for people who are coming into the field. So the call was for people who just recently finished their MFA, people in BFAs, and we also opened the call to people who don't have professional training or academic training because we understand that in our community, going to college is a privilege and one that, you know, is often super traumatic for the person who's going to college. So the exhibition that we did at the University of Virginia will also be coming to other spaces near you after we concluded a lot of different organizations have reached out about continuing to expand these efforts. And I feel like we just tapped on the surface, right? This was the first iteration of the possibility of something that we can see and something that we can tell people about. But also as this exhibition goes to different places, it will be reactionary of those spaces and it will talk about the immigration policies and politics of these locations. It is completely different for me to talk about policy from California than it was for me to take this to Virginia, right? In the University of Virginia, there's less than 1% undocked students. At the University of California, where I'm currently at, there's many of us, there's full departments of us. So I think it's important to contextualize what immigration means and how it shifts on different states based on different policies, but also to have an umbrella understanding of how we all belong to a community and how we can continue to make our own resources while the arts organizations catch up to our needs. That is where I will conclude for questions. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erika. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to uh, chat them um, in the chat box directly to Erika or myself. But um, re I, I mean, that so much information to unpack and um, your research in the last three years has been so, um, well, you say it's not comprehensive. It's, you know, it's really the, it's just the, a tip of the iceberg, if you will. And yeah, so yeah. how um, how can we uh, join in your efforts of research and uh, how can we, a collective call to action, if you will, like mm -hmm. what what would you like the art industry and you know all industries as whole, well, just as humans to, to be able to help in this? <laughs> I think, you're not wrong, right? When I told my advisor at my PhD what I was doing, she looked at me like, Erica, that's 10 years worth of research. And I was like, I, I have it coming. I understand this, right? And I just barely tacked the surface of this. Um, I think on the one hand, right, my call to action is to have other undocked creatives reach me so that we can begin to continually work together. But also other undock um, academics who are thinking through policy and politics and migration, I'm calling them in to start thinking about the arts. And other people who are thinking about arts, I'm calling you all in to start thinking about migration. I think that this is a very unique kind of intersection of things where, right, we're so used to talking about races and genders at museums and arts organizations because well we're reactive right we don't we don't start the conversation ourselves but we're seeing a community that unites us all together and also a community that no one speaks about so i think i think it's important that we start acknowledging that there's a usual invisibility about undocumentedness within the arts and i think you know, if more arts professionals can start learning how to just even talk about these issues, it will demystify a lot of the barriers, right? If just bringing these concerns onto the table will make sure that people who are undocumented have a space at the table. And mindfully, right? I'm also the one who thinks we should not have a table. Everybody should be sitting outside in the grass. 
but I think there's a lot to be done and there's no possible way I'm going to do this on my own. Not even if I devote the next 40 years of my life to it. So the more the merrier I'm here to create knowledge and community with anybody who wants to create knowledge and community with me. And if you're an undoc creative, join our collective efforts. Amazing. And I know you briefly mentioned uh, the resource and uh, policy uh, packets that you are currently working on. And I, one was define American. Um, one, to be able to really inform the broader um, group to how to go about you know, hiring and supporting undoc uh, creatives. What's the timeline on that um, publication? They're all or coming within the next couple of months. So oh, okay. before summer, they will both be released. Oh, amazing. And we just got a question in and, you know, uh, you shared a lot of the different programs and collectives that you're, um, you've kicked off, if you will. <laughs> How do you find resources and uh, for support of all these programs? I, I guess financial resources, what uh, this question is referring to? So financial resources are extremely tricky because federally speaking, you need citizenship. Citizenship is the first requirement with any, any A grant. Although I know a lot of individuals who have told me of ways that they're bypassing this um, request. But right now, all of our efforts are academic. And that means that giant institutions are fronting the bill, which is good and grand. But also, if these efforts continue to be pushed towards the creative industries and right arts institutions and museums, that means that later in the path, we're going to need to have a fleet of people who are actively knowing how to speak about undocumentedness so that they can apply for all sorts of funding. And one thing that we also always think about is that every member of the undocumented community cannot legally work and that's not that's like the least from the truth first and foremost right daca demics have working permits and every single daca holder probably has a degree of some sort um but also a ton of us are professionals with legal working permits and a lot of us can bypass a lot of the red tape which isn't to say that that's the case for everybody but you, as an undoc creative, you can open an LLC and be paid as a corporation instead of an individual and still pay taxes at the end of the day. So there are a ton of loopholes to getting all of these people compensated for their time, but also there aren't enough organizations that are making funding available for people without citizenship requirements. So I feel like the beginning portion of this is to learn the language and then to call some people into the table and then to start shifting the conversation about why is citizenship a legal requirement when 11 million people in the United States today don't have it. Amazing. Um, and I don't know if Erika, you're getting any questions. I am not. Yeah, okay, <laughs> don't be shy anyone. <laughs> Um, They're coming to but, you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, trying to tackle all of this misinformation um, surrounding uh, undoc creatives um, can be um, a bit isolating for, for anyone. Is there, in, in your collective, you know, you, you mentioned about meeting other undoc creatives through a snowball if, a methodology, if you will. Um, how how have you seen in this past year? How has it grown? You know, we start, uh, I think the publication uh, includes about 15, 12, 15? 12, uh, yeah. 12, um, 12 artists. Like how has it grown um, into a year, full year later, if you will? So there's, there's many people who cannot be included in this publication because they're not outwardly undocumented. There's a lot of people in our community that don't want to be associated with undocumentedness. So softly speaking, for the first project, solidly, there were 12 people. At the moment, a part of our collective efforts are closer to 30 people. In reality, we know about 200 people who are all in the creative industries, who are all not speaking out loud about any of their you know, stories or narratives or needs. Um, and this is something that we're navigating collectively. How do we, how, how can some of us, you know, 
also bring into the space the people who cannot physically be in the space or visibly be in the space. So that's one, one way in which it's growing, but also the, there's a lot of artists who are working from within the Andalk diaspora who have been working in immigration and migration and border issues for years and years. This is the first time that they're not the center of the conversation and the border isn't the important thing. Not every undocumented person has a relationship to the border, first and foremost. But also, right, these are like the first level allies because they have been talking about borders for however long. And a lot of those um, creatives who, you know, are citizens in their own right or second generation, third generation, who have been making art or, uh, you know, writing about immigration are now being extremely, you know, forthcoming, like, hey, how, what do you need? How do I help? Right? What am I doing? So it's it's a couple of hundred individuals at the moment who are like working together to figure out how to best continue to provide resources, not just for ourselves, but also for the next generations, right? One thing that we're extremely cognizant of is the fact that nobody helped us get here and we had to like figure it out all on our own one by one. And for the first time ever, there's a couple hundred of us who have some level of agency and are empowered with something. And how do we harness all of that together so that the undoc students now who are thinking of coming into the art industry will have a space in years to come. So I think this, again, this is in the beginning stages and it's gonna to continue to grow. Like we're seeing people in other countries already reaching us, right? Like our second book is in German. So there's a lot that other like countries are also thinking through and there's research happening in other places that's also really compelling to what we're doing. So it's just a matter of, you know, tying it all together to figure out how we continue to move from here purposefully, but also authentically and also mindfully. Uh, amazing. Sorry, just going through. Um, do some artists use uh, aliases as creatives to be able to participate in the undock industry? No. So by and large, the contemporary art world ties objects with people and your name is your brand, regardless of whether you want to or not. There are people who use aliases, but none of these people, right? Like we don't know if Banksy's undock. Uh, but in, the, in our collective efforts, the people who are not outwardly undocumented, don't use aliases, we use anonymity to speak about them. Interesting. That's, that's really interesting to know. And in it's also really of, complicated because we cannot utilize their artwork. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, it just it depends on people's own um, meeting people where they're at right, with their comfort level. And like you said, not everyone is undock and unafraid. Yeah, um, I have these these beautiful conversations with my undock viejitos who are much older, right, 60s, 70s, who will never in their life allow me to say that they're undock, their name and undock, right? Like you saw my slides, it's name and then it's a part of the spectrum, it's an immigrant, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and some people will just not let me do that, which I celebrate, I respect, I make space for. But at the same time, it's learning from their journeys to figure out how to, you know, set the path for the next generations. And even my own, I get a lot of wisdom from people that I cannot outwardly say I get wisdom from. So it's, it's interesting to na like navigate, but at the same time, it's something that we need to purposefully continue to do so that, you know, we're not just thinking about the next generations, but also the previous generation. Exactly. And it's um, it's quite difficult. And I think something you you mentioned during your presentation is that, you know, your research, um, you know, is very personal and leads to a lot of emotions. And I think uh, like many current art history students, <laughs> and I'm just trying to uh, uh, bring it back to the, the program and uh, the main audience here in the in this presentation um, just trying to think about the students or this next wave of 
future curators trying to bring in a more inclusive and holistic um, narrative into the art, his, uh, art history canon. And uh, a lot of it is tackling very difficult and emotional um, narratives and research. How, I guess, just trying to <laughs> long-winded way of asking you, like as a professor yourself, what, what are some of the advice that you give to your students who are eager to, you know, and have all this energy to continue pushing the field forward. Um, but, you know, it's a lot to take on. <laughs> I and... can tell you that not every day do I wake up wanting to challenge all of the canons and oppression, right? Some days I just need time and space to feel feelings and be upset and be angry. But also, I'm an immigrant. I have to create from a place of anger and pain, whether I want to or not sometimes. I think based on how I've been learning with other people and also based on thinking through how abstractive our field is, right? As a curator, I think that my professorship is informed by my curatorial practice and my curatorial practice is informed by my students in the same way that we need to move beyond the toxicity that we've created inside of our field, that we've continued to allow to thrive inside of our field in order to think about different models that can service our communities. So this, this last curatorial thesis of mine, um, I'm thinking about it more beyond the curatorial and as curatorial acompañamiento, right? So acompañamiento is like this body of work that was made by Lacey Abrego, who's like a Chicana scholar who talks about how within research, you accompany the people that you're interviewing and that you do testimonials because their narratives are your narratives because you have the cultural competency, right? She's an Im She studies immigration and she interviews immigrants. So for her, there's no dividing or divorcing yourself. There's no, this concept of like, you know, an academic has been completely unbiased because, you know, these people are so far removed from you. Service is absolutely no one. And it has created all of the problems that we continue to amplify in museums and galleries right now, where we're seeing subjects far removed and we don't humanize people who are currently living, right? So in order for me to think about my practice and to do so in an authentic kind of mindful way, I'm moving beyond all of the problems that I used to see and leaning onto theories that come from outside of museology so that I can move forward in a way that isn't just about making a space for me and my immigrant trauma, but learning how to meet all these different artists where they're at and bringing them all together to speak about what they want to speak about. Because ultimately, this isn't art for art's sake, right? The, the art is wonderful and it's beautiful and it's compelling and it's amazing. And I can talk about color for centuries, but this isn't what's happening here. Like, it doesn't matter if the thing is blue or orange. It's more important that I you know, I humanize this experience, but also that I let the people having the experiences be the experts of the experience, as opposed to pretend that I know better than anyone. Actually, my curatorial statement weaves their words in and out throughout so that you can understand from within their perspective, kind of like what we're trying to achieve. And I think that in, you know, being a professionally trained art historian with like a professional curatorial practice, I can see how we've made all of these very problematic issues a part of the foundation of the field. And I'm at a point in which it doesn't service me anymore, which is why I think I also left museums and galleries at a certain point, because some of that level of toxicity, which is not allow me to, you know, be in community with a peoples who sometimes are happy and sometimes are sad, just like every human in the planet. And to celebrate both their joy and their pain communally because art institutions don't always have space for that. And I want to make space for that in my practice and in my classroom. Does that answer your question or that I go someplace? No, 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 that? yes. No, 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 that yeah. completely answered my question. Thank you. And I think that there are times where, you know, it's, you know, we're asked to comp compartmentalize and be analytical and, and really leave our positionality at the door. And it's it's unfortunate, but um, 
and unnecessary. I think, you know, in trying to move the uh, the field forward, uh, we have to, you know, come to the door, come to the table <laughs> that we are going to get rid of um, completely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, completely ourselves and bring our our full history and narratives and our ancestors with us with everywhere we go. I think we need to be cognizant of a couple of different things. And Mark Bradford said it best, blackness walks through the door before I do, right? We need to be extremely cognizant of what comes in the door before you open your mouth. Because I can walk in the door and talk about immigration until I turn blue in the face. But when I walk in the door, that's not what people are going to see. And I am also very cognizant of the privilege of not being black or being um, indigenous, like, you know, um, and all of the the levels of wealth that I'm allowed to partake in, which is not to say that, right, all of the individuals in those communities are not allowed to partake in them, but some doors are more open to individuals who look more like you and me than to anyone else. And we need to be cognizant of that in the room. So on the one hand, right, let's lean on to every possible privilege we can possibly get to walk in that door. And then once we're in that door, Let's talk about bringing our entire ancestry in with us. But also, I cannot tell you how many times I've been in spaces in which, right, people don't understand Latinx, let alone immigration. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had to explain to people, like, right, this is my community, and for them to just disregard it. I think that a happier place where I'm at now is where I'm very cognizant of the fact that my energy service more when I'm in spaces in which people are authentically paying attention to me, even if they're allies, versus the performativity of the arts industry. And thankfully, I've leaned away from it. And as much as I possibly can write, it's still very performative. And performance is a part of what we do in the arts industry. So that's also something to be cognizant about. But in the middle of all of that, I think it's important to take into consideration not just who we are and what we want to talk about, but also what possible doors we can open for the people who are having louder conversations and more important conversations than we are to allow them to walk in front of us, right? And I don't think that's something that our industry does in any capacity, right? We're so used to taking all of the space in the room because, right, that's the center of our industry. And that's not something that I see as servicing our industry moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for your insight and your, your thoughts. Um, I know we are a little bit over time and Erika, I can sit here and talk to you for hours. <laughs> um, we'll have to grab some coffee, <laughs> but um, <laughs> wanting to just uh, really thank you for sharing your time, energy, and uh, digital space with us today um, and for everyone joining um, wanting to pass it over to Cecilia for some closing remarks and uh, thank you so much Erika. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yes. Erika thank you thank you it's um, a really touching thought-provoking important um, proposition that you're making I am personally all about breaking down barriers and, and barriers that constantly making themselves evident and you know I've, I'm an immigrant but I've, I've I'm not an undocumented immigrant but even then it's been sometimes difficult for me and I can only imagine how that been but and I also so so share with you this idea of a creation of a community breaking down hierarchies and really you know for for the this art or creative universe to be a place of uh, this kind of broad citizenship that um, we can be who we are and we don't have to conduct and play a power game, which is so, you know, I think it really has deformed a lot what art can be. How can art bring us together, uh, you know, beyond, as you say, orange and blue in the in the picture plane. So thank you so much for, for your talk and Delia Sofia for moderating the event. And um, I will... We will keep in touch and I have an idea for doing something together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I for am all about you. it. Thank you, ladies.
Thank I'll you. Thank you, soon. you, everybody, for coming to the to the talk today. To very soon. Thank you.